Hello, this is the Unit 3 screencast for Sections 1 through 3. Unit 3 is on Intermolecular Forces and Properties. Here's a few optional videos that I posted for you that you can watch. So, Unit 3, um, well, before we get started, um, first of all, AP Classroom Assignments. Um, I know some of these assignments are um, the way that you had to submit the answers can be a little bit tedious. Um, um, you can submit on either email or um, uploading things onto AP Classroom. Um, pick one or the other. You don't have to do both. And if you are if you're, if you're submitting through AP Classroom, if, if it's a question that requires several different uploads, uh, what you can do to make it a little easier is just put everything onto one screenshot or photo um, so you don't have to do multiple uploads. So that might be a little bit easier. And then another thing, understand that for uh, all this distance learning, um, any due dates that I give you are they're mostly recommendations. There's no real hard due dates. So if you fall behind, you can catch up. You can get all those assignments in for full credit. All right, section 3.1 is on intermolecular forces. Uh, the learning objective is explain the relationship between the chemical structures of molecules and the relative strength of their intermolecular forces when A, the molecules are of the same chemical species, and B, the molecules are of two different chemical species. So the, the first uh, bit of the essential knowledge is London dispersion forces. Now, um, first of all, with this, intermolecular forces is forces that are between different molecules, um, not covalent or ionic. Those are intramolecular forces. And these are all coulombic, as in, you know, coulombic forces are uh, proportional to charge over distance. So the first one listed here is a London dispersion force. Um, London dispersion forces are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. Um, some things to understand with this, all particles have London dispersion forces, but with nonpolar particles, uh, that is the only intermolecular force that they have. Um, understand with London dispersion, um, what makes it weak is that it's only a temporary force and it's caused by uneven distribution of electrons. So normally in a, uh, in a nonpolar particle, there's an even distribution of the electrons but the electrons move around and eventually you can get a situation where there's more electrons on one side of the particle than the other. And that causes uneven distribution of electrons and that causes a temporary dipole. And then they can have attractive forces between other charged particles. But it's a short lived force and it's very weak. Um, another thing you want to do with London dispersion forces is compare different nonpolar particles on their strength of the London dispersion force. Um, some examples of things that have um, that are nonpolar that only have London dispersion force would be the the diatomics. So, um, like H two or N two O two, those diatomics. Um, or hydrocarbons, things made out of just carbon and hydrogen. If it's just carbon and hydrogen, it's going to be a nonpolar particle. So when, when you're comparing London dispersion forces for particles like this, um, the larger the particle, the more electrons they have, the more polarizable they are, and that leads to stronger London dispersion forces. Uh, next, we have dipole-dipole interactions or dipole-dipole forces, um, and this happens between uh, polar molecules where you have a permanent dipole, and this is stronger than than uh, London dispersion forces in general. And uh, if you have, if you're comparing different dipole-dipole-dipole interactions, it's uh, if you have a more polar particle, as in a greater electronegativity difference, and if you have a smaller particle that leads to a stronger Coulombic force. Uh, the next one is ion dipole forces, and that's usually this situation down here, and that generally happens between water, which is a polar molecule, 
and ions in, in like a ionic solution. So this situation right here where you have the negative end of the water molecule is attracted to the positive sodium ion in this case. If you have a negative ion like, like the fluoride ion, then it would be the other end of the water molecule that would be attracted to it. But that's called an ion dipole force. That's this one right here. And the strongest of the three is hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is just a stronger version of a dipole-dipole interaction. And it happens when you have hydrogen within the molecule. If you have hydrogen bonded to either oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. And the reason why it's so strong, um, there's a large electronegativity difference between hydrogen and, and those three elements. So that leads to a very polar molecule. And they're also very small. So that leads to uh, closer interactions. So a stronger charge and a smaller distance between the particles makes for a, a stronger columbic force. Okay, next we have 3.2 properties of solids. The learning objective here is to explain the relationship among the macroscopic properties of a substance, the particulate level structure of the substance, and the interactions between these particles. Uh, some of the essential knowledge. Um, first thing you want to know is uh, melting point versus lattice energy. Um, this is what uh, you know particle level of a solid. The the points here in the solid they're called lattice points, and the the coulombic force or the energy holding them together that's called the lattice energy. So the stronger the lattice energy, the more energy it takes to break them apart, and that leads to higher melting points. So stronger forces, stronger lattice energies, higher lattice energy leads to a higher melting point. And then with all these different types of solids, you want to be able to draw what's happening at the particle level. All right, and then there's four solids that you want to know about. Um, so you have ionic solids, and this is the a drawing of an ionic solid right over here, sodium chloride. So with, with ionic solids, you have ions, are the lattice points and then the the lattice energy in between them the force holding them together is an ionic bond which is relatively strong so something like table salt is an example of an ionic solid and then uh, with the since it's a strong energy holding the the salt together an ionic solid together um, it leads to high melting points high boiling points um, they tend to be brittle because if these ions are displaced, then they get next to a particle that has a similar charge and they repel and they break apart. Um, they also, um, ionic solids also only conduct electricity when these ions are free to move. So that happens when these um, turn into a, a, a liquid, so you melt it, or if they get uh, dissolved in water, then the ions are free to move. But in the solid form, they don't conduct electricity. Uh, the next one down here is a covalent uh, network solid. A an example of that would be diamond. And the lattice points here, uh, they tend to be atoms. And the bond that holds them together is a covalent bond. And, and it tends to be a strong bond, just like the ionic bond. So these tend to be uh, very hard, very brittle and they don't conduct electricity um, because of these strong bonds and, and the, the electrons are localized, they're not free to move around. Then uh, the next one, you have molecular solids. Um, that's an example is right over here, and this would be ice. So molecular solids, you have uh, complete molecules at the lattice point. In this case, in, in ice, it would be a water molecule. And what holds them together, in this case, it's hydrogen bond. But in general, for molecular solids, it's an intermolecular force that's holding them together, which are relatively weak. So it takes uh, very little energy, generally, to break them apart and melt them. So because of this, they tend to have you know, lower melting points, um, they don't conduct electricity because their valence electrons are held within these covalent bonds within the molecules. 
Then uh, the last one, metallic solids. So something like uh, copper is an example. And this is a drawing of a metallic solid. We've seen this before. Um, the lattice points are these metal ions and it's delocalized electrons uh, that are in between these metal ions that are free to move around. So they have, it's called the sea of electrons. So metals are malleable, ductile, um, which means you can pound them into a thin sheet. Um, because the, the electrons are mobile, they conduct electricity very well. And then 3.3 is on solids, liquids, and gases. And the learning objective here is to represent the differences between solid, liquid, and gas phases using a particulate level model. And the essential knowledge here, uh, basically you just want a very general understanding of what's going on at the particle level for, for these different substances. Uh, with a solid, you want to know that there's crystalline and amorphous solids. Crystallines are the, the solids that we talked about in the previous section, where it's an ordered arrangement of the particles. In an amorphous solid, um, it, it tends to be a, um, a random arrangement of the particles that make up the solid, and they tend to be softer um, than, than the crystalline solids. And then in a liquid particle, the particles are, are still condensed, so they're close together, but they have the ability to flow. And in gases, the particles are relatively far apart compared to, to liquids and solids. And um, we'll talk a little more about how the particles behave in gases uh, in a later section. All right, that's it for today. Have a good day.